So last but not least in this module is depreciation. The thing I hate about depreciation is it's not really very intuitive. You can't just sound out what you think it should be. You can't just take an asset and divide by whatever its life is and that's what the depreciation is going to be. It is based on rules. Rules about categories, about useful lives, and special rules about when you can take extra depreciation and when you cannot. The new 2018 tax laws change depreciation pretty significantly. So we're going to have to learn both the old way and the new way because your clients will have assets from prior years as well as new assets for the new stuff that they've purchased going forward. We're going to get into all of the fun details and by the end you'll know how to do just about everything there is to, to do when it comes to depreciation. But there is one area I'm not going to cover in uh, you know, kind of massive detail. That is real estate depreciation. I have a small little section on it, but I just want to kind of give the caveat here that there's a, a lot of things in real estate depreciation that, I, that I'm not going to cover. Like, like cost segment analysis and, and leasehold improvements and, and some other things. Don't worry though, I'm going to uh, cover some of those topics in some HFA meetings that we do this year. So we are going to be all set. I'm just not covering it in this because this section is already long enough and uh, dives deep into a lot of accounting and, and will be a grind already. So to get started, I am going to kind of get into the definition and theory behind depreciation, and then we will move into some of the more advanced concepts. So simply put, depreciation is the systematic reduction of the recorded cost of a fixed asset. Yep, sounds kind of like a textbook, right? I'm pretty sure that's where I found it. So let me, let me see if I can try and put it another way. When a business buys something that will last longer than a year, the useful life of that asset then extends past our tax reporting time frames of 12 months. As you know, most, if not all, tax returns go 12 months. There are ways to make tax returns a little bit different than that. But uh, for this discussion, when things last longer than 12 months, we have to start thinking about them through the, the prism of depreciation. That is, you know, why things that are not going to last longer than a year or normally uh, last longer than a year just get expensed in the current year and not depreciated. So that 12-month time frame is a big issue. But when they can last longer, we have to figure out how we are going to expense them over that longer time frame. And that time frame is called a useful life. Now, in reality... If I buy a stapler, I've got a stapler here on the screen, the useful life as dictated by the uh, depreciation tables uh, is, is categorized as seven years, meaning I'm going to spread the cost of that stapler over seven years. But if a stapler is treated fairly well, it could last, it could last 50 years, right? So this is one of the first examples of how depreciation is not intuitive. Uh, we, we probably should depreciate a stapler over 50 years, right? But that's not the way that the world works. We make up a useful life so that we can be consistent across all kinds of assets. But you get the idea. Everything has a useful life and we're going to spread the cost of that item out over that time frame. Uh, what do I mean by spread the cost out? Right. I mean, we need to we need to kind of move to the next step of depreciation here. Uh, let me use our stapler example, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some of that on the next on the next screen. So let's say I purchased a stapler for seventy dollars, and seventy dollars. I know that's a spendy stapler. It better be the best doggone stapler I've ever used, right? <laughs> but um. I bet you can guess why I chose $70 in this case, right? Because we're going to depreciate it over seven years. So I wanted to use an amount that, that made some sense. So to depreciate something, we take the cost, $70, and divide by the useful life. 
So as I'm showing in the example, 70 divided by 7 means you get $10 of depreciation a year. That expense goes on the income statement under depreciation. That is the only expense related to the asset. When we purchased it, we did not write it off. We capitalized it on the balance sheet. So all we get for our 70 outflow, $70 of outflow, right, in the first year is a $10 expense. This is another area where depreciation is hard for, for us and really hard for our clients. Whenever they spend $70 and they see $70 go out the door, they want that to show that way on the tax return too, right? They want to see the whole $70 go out the door, not just 10 and I can tell you there are ways to have that happen. I'm going to show you some of, of those strategies where you can expense the whole thing here in a little bit. But in this example, this is the traditional way depreciation works. Well, I should say traditional, except for one thing. It doesn't really work this way. <laughs> and this is a very simple example of what we would call straight line depreciation, meaning it's the same for each year. You can divide it by the useful life, and that's going to be what the expense is for each of the years uh, in the depreciation schedule. But unfortunately, we have to operate on something different for most of our assets. It is a, it is a type of depreciation called makers, M-A-C-R-S. And that's what we have to really use for our stapler. Let me kind of start showing you a little bit about makers. Makers depreciation is what makes depreciation a little bit more complex. Let me come over to the next screen and I'm going to get started about how the real depreciation goes down. So as we get a little more confusing here, uh, let me give you this, this quick disclaimer. Don't get intimidated. The only requirement of uh, that I've ever found, the, the thing that is required to learn accounting and tax is your willingness to repeat lessons. Let me say that again. The only thing that's gonna hold you back from learning how to do taxes and really even how to do accounting is your willingness to repeat lessons. Meaning eventually they sink in. You just watch lessons over and over again until this stuff sinks in. And believe me, it will make sense. If, if it doesn't make sense the first time, just keep coming around to it, it will. So, makers. Okay, Maker's Depreciation. Maker's stands for Modified Asset Cost Recovery System. And just a, it's really just a made-up name for saying a bunch of rules that you can't really guess at. And one of the tenets of Maker's is something called the convention. You can have a half-year convention and a mid-quarter convention. There is a mid-month convention, too, uh, that applies to real estate, though. so I'm not going to worry about it here. I am going to mention it when I talk a little bit about the real estate depreciation in a few slides. But for now, let's just get our minds around mid-quarter and half year, okay? So for each year, your business uh, is, is putting assets to work, and we're going to use depreciation. It either has to choose between the mid-quarter convention or the half-year convention. This is all dependent on how many assets you place in service for the year. One year, like let's say 1999, could be mid-quarter, while the year 2000 could be half year. So the years can be different depending on what assets are placed in service each year. Uh, that's an important point to understand is it, once you establish mid-quarter, it doesn't mean you're going to be mid-quarter every single year for the life of the business. It depends on what assets you're putting into, into service each year as to what that year's convention is going to be. So they can be interchangeable by year. To decide if you must use mid-quarter or half year for a, given, for a given tax year, here's the test. If more than 40% of the total assets, and this is by cost, so we're gonna add up the cost of total assets. If more than 40% of those assets by cost were placed in service after October 1st, meaning in the fourth quarter of the tax year, of a calendar tax year, then you must use mid-quarter convention. Otherwise, we use half year. And I bet you can guess which is better, right? Well, again, you can't. 
uh, mid quarter sometimes is better. So, but in the for the most part, for most businesses, half year probably yields better depreciation by just a little bit. Simple, right? I mean, forty percent of assets you can add them up. Which do you do? Just add up the assets, and if they're more than forty percent of the cost, if if more than forty percent is put into place in the fourth quarter, then you know what to do. Keep in mind, okay, this is not based on the number of assets. It is the cost. So if you purchased 100 assets for $5 in January, but one asset in December for $10,000, you're going to be mid-quarter because that one asset was valued much, much more than the 100 assets that you put into place in January. Makes sense? This is all based on the cost of the total assets. If, you know, based on the choice that you just made, that's going to tell you what depreciation tables to use. So the, the point of this slide is to say, this is how you test whether you're mid-quarter or half year. Once you know that, okay, for let's say tax year is 2018, and it turns out that you that 40% of the assets were not placed in service in the fourth quarter and your half year, now you know what your convention is and you move on to the depreciation tables. That's on the next slide. Let me show you how that works. And here they are. Now, the four on the right are super small in this slide. I get that. I did not plan on you really needing to use them as part of the, the course here. You know, frankly, our calculator in Halon does all of this for you. So, but I, I still wanted you to understand the theory behind depreciation, kind of how it's calculated. We want to be able to answer questions and show confidence to our clients when it comes to all things taxes. So we're kind of in the nitty gritty here. At the end of the day, Halon's going to do all of this for you. But again, I kind of wanted to show you what's going on here. So there's four tables on the right. Those are the mid-quarter tables. And then there's a table on the left. That is the half-year table. And uh, here's, here's kind of how they work. Let's start with the easy one. Let's say that less than half, less than 40% of our assets this year were placed into service after October 1st, meaning, like I said in the last slide, we're going to use the half year convention, right? So the table I use is the A1 table that's on the left, okay? Every single asset, regardless of when I purchase it, uses this table. Now, let's take a look at the three-year column. So over on the left, you can see all those years on the left. Let's take a look at year three. So it's three down. In the first year, three-year property gets a deduction equal to 33.33% of the cost. Do you see that? So let me, I'm going to get my highlighter out. So we're on this table, right? This is three-year property. And this is the year that we're trying to calculate depreciation for, whether it's the first year, the second year, the third year, or even the 21st year, okay? If I purchase three-year property in the first year, it means we're going to use this percentage of 33%, 33.33% of the cost of the asset. In year two, our depreciation expense is 44.45%. In year three, it's 14.81%. And in year four... Year four? Wait, hold on just a second. Didn't you just say it's three-year property, Chris? Why is there four years here? Yep, that is Makers. Again, not intuitive, right? Makers is weird like that. Another example um, of why depreciation is, you can't guess at this. Every asset will actually be depreciated one year past their useful life. Take a look at this. Five-year property, right? It's right here. One, two, three, four, five. We should be done with these, but we're not. We've got a piece of the percentage here. Now, all of these should add up to 100%, right? I've never really added them all up, but they should add up to 100% because you're taking a percentage of the cost basis. And at the, at the end of four years with three-year property, we should have depreciated the whole thing, right? But um, And if I added them up, I'm guessing they add up. I've never done it before, but that's the, that's the idea. In... In this half-year convention group, 
that's how it's calculated. It's pretty easy, right? I mean, once you know that you're half year convention, really all you're doing is trying to look up what the property is, what year you're in, and this is what our software does already. It has this whole table built into it and you come up with what the depreciation expense is. That's it. If if we're going to talk about mid quarter, however, you know, and and it gets a little bit more complicated. So if if your assets, when you added them up, forty percent of them were placed in service in the fourth quarter, fell in the last quarter after October first, then you have to use these four charts here. They're not a whole lot different than this one, but. Because there's four of them, we have to choose by asset which one we're supposed to use. Which chart you use is based on when the asset was placed in service. So once you know that this tax year is going to be mid-quarter, then you look at when the asset was actually placed in service. So if it was placed in service in January through March, which is first quarter, you're going to use the first quarter chart. If it was placed in second quarter, you're going to use the second quarter. You get this, right? So when it was placed in service determines what chart they're going to use. The charts work the same. As I said, they work the same as this one, but they have different figures on them. So you have to choose the right one for the right assets. You know, if there's, if there's ever been a moment where we're thankful for software, it has to do with uh, conventions and depreciation, right? Thank goodness for software. Halon does all of this for you. So once you get the date purchased and amounts, see what happens is, is Halon pulls from your QuickBooks Online account the date that fixed assets were purchased, the amount they were purchased for, the name of them, pulls all of that and is ready for you in Halon. All you do is code what it was. Was it furniture? Was it software? Was it a car? Was it equipment? And then Halon does all of this stuff for you. It's great from the standpoint of it's easy, but we need to make sure that we understand this because in order to be able to advise clients if they ever ask a question and you don't feel like calling Halon's CPA tax team to get answers and you want to be able to answer something about depreciation, well, now you know. Come back and watch this again and you'll, you'll, you'll see how all of this is done. So now that we know conventions and we know the depreciation tables and we've got a pretty good idea of, of you know, makers, let's kind of move on to some examples. I want to show you some of the amounts of depreciation, a little bit about something we call the, the or something that's called the Halon depreciation calculator. So here's our stapler. And I am in the Halon depreciation calculator right now. We are, we have put the stapler in. Let me pull up my highlighter here. We put the stapler in, right? And we've set it to a date of 1-1-2016. Uh, it's the only asset we have this year. So since it was put into service uh, outside of fourth quarter, we're going to be using half-year convention, right? So when we're using half-year convention, in the first year, since 2016 is the first year it was placed in service, the depreciation amount is $10. And if this was placed in service in April or in uh, September, this would be what we would use. Now, let's say it was placed in service. It's the only asset we have, but it was placed in service in November. Ah, that would mean over if 40% of our assets were placed in uh, last quarter, right? And this would switch to mid-quarter convention. So let me show you what that looks like. All right, so here we are. We have the same stapler example, only this time I have a second asset. So we can kind of see what mid-quarter does at all these different quarters. The second asset's called Big Guy, and it was placed into service 11-1. And the reason it's here. We're not going to really look at big guy much, but I wanted more than 40% of my assets placed in service in the fourth quarter so that the whole system uses mid-quarter convention. So take a look at this. Here's what I'm, I'm going to show you several slides here. In first quarter, look at what our staple depreci stapler depreciation is in first quarter. 1750. Okay. Now let me show you what it looks like in second quarter. 
Look at this. See here, 1250 because it was it was placed in service in second quarter. See how those tables change? Nothing else has changed. The cost basis is the same. Big guy's still here, all of that, but we get less depreciation. Now, let me actually show you fourth quarter. Same everything here, only now we only get $2.50 of depreciation on that. So you can see how mid-quarter, if you end up in a situation where a whole bunch of assets were put into service at the end of the year, um, the depreciation can go down because those fourth quarter assets don't get much depreciation when you're going to mid-quarter convention. Now on half-quarter convention, doesn't matter when they're placed in service, they all get the same depreciation no matter what. And if I go back, remember how on half, on half year it was $10? Well, look at this. I'm gone back now to first quarter. Look at that. That's $17.50. So if you are mid-quarter in a mid-quarter convention year and you placed a whole bunch of assets in service in January, you actually get more depreciation than you would have in half year. So it it's tricky like that, right? Here's, here's my advice. <laughs> Don't get too hung up on this. I mean, a lot of people think there's a tax planning opportunity with timing of fixed assets, and there probably is. But I'm telling you, it's not worth trying to figure out. Just make sure you book assets correctly. Encourage your clients to purchase assets whenever they can. Because assets help the tax returns, right? They, they help you save money. They, they're a way to spend money and help you reduce taxable income. Uh, other than that, just know that Halon's going to do most of these calculations for you. You just got to do a little bit of data entry, which we'll show you in depth as part of the Halon training that uh, comes for, for everyone after the course is over. And, uh, you know, just just roll with it. Halon support and the CPA tax team are always here to help you through all of this. So, again... Don't be too intimidated by it, but we do need to know it. If this wasn't making sense, watch it a couple times, and I think it's I think it's going to uh, make sense as as you watch it more and more. Now, let me take a quick break here and say something about land. Land is funny; it cannot be depreciated. So, if you buy farmland or just a vacant lot, no depreciation. Also the land a building is on cannot be depreciated. So when someone buys a building, they need the appraiser to separate out the land value and the building value. This is, this is super common. This breakout idea is super common on commercial properties. It's not as common in residential applications, but just know that you got to break out land and building if you're doing some real estate stuff. We're going to talk more about real estate in a few slides, but just wanted to chime in here on land. Land is not depreciable, so it gets zero depreciation, okay? As I said earlier, there are ways to expense more than what makers will give you. The two ways I'm going to cover uh, in the next couple of slides. Uh, one is called Section 179 and one is called Bonus Depreciation. First, let's talk, let's discuss Section 179. Before the new 2018 tax law, Section 179 was a really big deal. It allowed you to just expense uh, what is called tangible property or another way to think about that is the stuff that businesses use. It allowed you to expense all of that uh, up to a certain limit if you purchased it during the tax year. So brand new stuff. So, you know, this can be equipment, it can be software, it can be staplers like we were just talking about, it can be desks. Really, it's kind of easier to think about what is not allowed in Section 179. And for the most part, that's buildings. So you couldn't buy a building and just uh, Section 179 it. But desks and other things, you could. The 2018 tax law changed some of this because uh, part of it is something called 100% expensing. And it's uh, on very similar assets to 179. So... We're not going to use Section 179 nearly as much for the next several years. But for now, as I'm explaining it and teaching you what it was, I want you to kind of imagine that they didn't change it and it's it's back 
in prior years, and we really do need to use Section 179 because that's the best thing that we have. Okay? So, Section 179 said that a business could expense up to $1 million worth of property that was purchased that year. You could not go back and claim it on old assets. This is just for new stuff that you bought. And that $1 million amount, it tended to move around a lot from tax year to tax year. Sometimes it was half a million, other times it was two million. Congress would play with it every single year. And part of uh, something called the tax extenders bill that they always like pass on Christmas Eve or some nonsense always had like a new section 179 limit to it. The expense is not depreciation. Okay. And on the screen I'm showing you, it's part of that good old Schedule K. Now, it acted like depreciation, it smelled like depreciation, it walked like depreciation, but it wasn't depreciation. It, it simply allowed you to reduce income, but with a very large caveat. You could use it as an expense, but you could not use it to run a loss. So you had to have income in the business to offset whatever you were taking as Section 179. Meaning, you know, you had to be a profitable business to use Section 179. Whereas traditional depreciation, it can run you into a loss. It's, it's like a real expense. It, it can run you into a huge loss if you want it to. Whatever, you know, was left after what you could take 179 on. So, you know, the other picture in this example, let's imagine that you had equipment purchases of $150,000 but you only had income of $75,000, that means you could only do section 179 of $75,000. And whatever was left of that equipment that you bought, you depreciated the normal way. Okay, Whatever was left of your assets got depreciated the normal way or with bonus depreciation, which I'm going to show you next. Now, from here, I could fill your head with lots of section 179 law and techniques. But Again, until about 2023, I don't think you're going to be using it much. And that's because the new law has us expensing 100% of assets now using bonus depreciation, which I'm, I'm going to show you next. So if 2023 rolls around and we're, and we're going to need Section 179, I'm going to cover it then. I'll do a big section on it and, and show you exactly how it all works. Uh, just know that back in the day, it was a big deal. It was Section 179 was a very big deal. Um, the big reason I wanted to show it to you was because when you're loading assets into Halon that are for prior years, so like the stuff that was bought in 2017 and, and before, you're going to have to tell Halon what was Section 179 in the past. I'm going to show you how to do all of that uh, in this lesson, but best that you know kind of where it came from, right? Like what was section 179 and how did it work? Well, that's why I wanted to show you, you know, in this, in this piece. Does that make sense? So now, now that we've covered section 179, let's jump into bonus depreciation because this one you're going to use a ton, a ton. Okay. Now we're going to get into bonus depreciation. That is exactly what it sounds like. An extra bonus you can take in the first year that you purchased an asset. Before 2018, the normal bonus depreciation percentage was 50%. That meant that if you purchased a $10,000 desk, you could take 50% of the price you know, $5,000 as bonus depreciation, which means you expense that. Then you would also start normal depreciation. However, the basis for your normal depreciation started at 5,000 because that was the remaining basis. So see part, you'd get five grand of bonus depreciation, then you'd get like whatever the maker's depreciation was on a $5,000 asset, essentially. That can be a little bit tricky, right? Uh, because the, you know, the official depreciation and the cost basis does not really line up with the purchase cost. Um, and and they, they, they get the, the depreciation, but they get it in kind of a, a weird way, right? And clients a lot of times would ask questions of how does this work? How come only half of my 
asset got expensed. I want the whole thing expensed. You know, there's lots of that. That was 2017 and earlier, 2017 and before. For 2018, the tax law says this. New assets that have a 20-year life or less. So most everything that businesses buy are 20 years and less. Really, the only thing that's longer than that are some really big assets like trains and things like that, I think, and then uh, buildings and residential real estate. So everything that a business gets its 20-year life or less is gets 100% bonus depreciation. That is how they they word things when they mean to say 100% expensing. That that is the way that this works. So the law isn't the law does not say anything you buy just write off on the income statement. What it says is anything that's a 20-year life or, or less, put it on the balance sheet and then we're going to let you have 100% bonus depreciation on it. That's the way that 100% expensing works. This is the law until 2023. Then, starting in 2023, it goes to 80%, then to 60%, and then down more in years after until I think in like 2027, it's maybe nothing. So for the next four years, this is being shot in 2018, so that for the next four years, everything is 100% except for like real estate and a few other odd categories. All of which are not really ap- applicable to Halon clients. I mean, some Halon clients are going to have commercial property, but not in, in massive amounts, and most of them won't. So this really makes new assets and depreciation fairly easy, right? Because desks, chairs, computers, software, equipment, all of that stuff, all the stuff you can buy is simply going to be expensed using bonus depreciation. Still, as I said, it means you have to capitalize it. Just means that, you know, you're going to have to do you're going to have to put it on the balance sheet um, and this only applies to new assets. You know, it it does not apply to uh, the stuff that you have coming in from 2017 or 2016. So one of the questions I used to or I got at the beginning of this year is, well, if we're doing 100% expensing, does that mean all my assets that still have basis from you know, prior years, I get to write all that off too? And the answer is no. The government is trying to incentivize people to go out and spend money now, not really trying to give them a deduction for money they've already spent. So old assets are going to have to do it just the normal way. For 2018 and beyond, yes, you get to write off all of these uh, 20-year useful life and less assets. So let's kind of Let's kind of do an example of the old way and the, and the new way here. I'm going to get my highlighter back out. So here's the 2017 example, right? And desk costs 10 grand. Bonus depreciation was $5,000. Basis after the bonus depreciation was five grand, right? Because we, su- we subtract that from the 10. Then the regular depreciation for year one on a $5,000 asset is $715. So the total depreciation for year one was $5,715. Now, let me say something that you're probably already thinking because we already did section 179. Well, why wouldn't they just 179 all of this? Well, remember, in a business that had enough income to do it, they would have. They would have section 179 it or at least a portion of it and then use bonus for the rest. If you didn't have enough income, you couldn't use section 179, so you were left with bonus depreciation. Okay? The same is kind of true on 2018. A desk that costs 10 grand, now we get 100% bonus depreciation. So we write the whole thing off at this level. The basis is zero now, so regular depreciation is zero, and depreciation for year one is 10 grand. Why wouldn't you use section 179 here and why I say I don't think you'll use it much? A, because you don't have to. There's no limit to this. You can use this for every single asset. If you buy a billion dollars worth of desks at 10 grand, you can write off the billion dollars worth of desks. You couldn't do that with section 179. So I think people are going to ignore section 179 because it has income limits, right? And why even worry about it when you can just nail it with the bonus depreciation and it's all gone if you want the lowest possible tax return. You can elect out of bonus depreciation, as funny as that may sound. You can actually say, hey, I don't want bonus depreciation. That could be because you're trying to to get the expense in a in a future year because your tax rate isn't very high this year. There's lots of little planning things like that. At Halon, most of our folks are small business owners and they want the lowest amount of tax possible for most situations. So we're going to employ it in, in almost every situation unless there's a, a valid reason for us not to. So 
that is the way that bonus depreciation works. Does that make sense? I mean, it, it it's kind of easy. And like I said, for 2018, we're going to be using a lot of it. Uh, things are going to get depreciated 100% here going forward for a while. So let me jump into uh, how to load Halon a little bit in this these prior year assets. I want to show you how to read a tax return on how to get some of this information that you're going to need. So we're going to spend some time uh, on this asset detail screen because I want you to be ready. This is something you will need to do at some point with, with some clients because they're going to have assets that were placed in service prior to 2018, right? I mean, you, you're going to have several clients like this. So you're going to have to know how to read a schedule and do a little bit of data entry into Halon, making sure things are entered correctly. Now, you only have to do it once, right? Because once Halon understands what was done in the past, if you use Halon every single year after that, Halon knows everything. You don't have to load this all the time. But for brand new clients, you're going to have to load a little bit of information for us. The main things that we're looking for on prior assets and on the schedules of, of tax returns are Section 179 expense, any bonus depreciation, and the accumulated depreciation. Okay, so we're looking for three things. Now, first things first, let's make sure we we understand the, the tax return schedule that shows all of this. And that's over here on the left. Let's take a look at the two images here, the two images on the left. This is a sliced up version of an attachment to a business tax return. Um, and I say sliced up because I wanted it to fit on the on the slide, but really, what it really looks like is it's a one-page document, and this is out of a tax system called Drake. Um, Drake is the system that Halon uses on its back end for some things and for Halon Assisted, so Drake uh, is a type of tax software, and um, it, does, it does some of the returns that Halon's not equipped to do yet. So this is a schedule and I chopped it down to get it on this slide, but let me kind of let me kind of show you what it's what it's saying here. So at the top, we've got three assets: asset number one, number two, number three. We've got equipment, we've got fitness equipment, we've got a pickup truck. Okay, and this one was placed in service 9-1-2014, 3-5-2015, 3-6-2016. Make sense? Here's the cost basis. So this is what QBO would be pulling, you know, or what Halon would be pulling out of QBO. This is the total cost that was paid for these assets. And in this case, they're all 100% business use um, assets. With with a truck where, you know, that may be a little odd, uh, but probably this truck is in the company's name. So it is 100% business use. And then like we covered in the, in the last uh, lesson, the, the personal use is grossed up. So anyways, here are, the, here are the three amounts. Now, as we get over to here, things start automatically getting confusing. And that's because tax software often puts things in weird ways. I would never have put the depreciable basis here because we actually need to understand some things that happen down here with these three assets. Again, here's asset one, two, and three. We're able to see the life. I have no idea why this is this until I've seen all of this down here. So I'm going to skip this for a second and come down here with me. The first thing we want to see is accumulated depreciation, right? This is the amounts that we're looking for from the standpoint of what is the total depreciation. But there's some trickiness to it. So I'm going to isolate asset number one here, okay? It's got a seven-year life. The, the maker's methodology is 200% declining balance. And then the percentage off the table is 12.49, okay? That's, that's what it's saying. Now, if we skip accumulated depreciation for a second, look here. Current depreciation on this asset was 434. So that is what the depreciation expense for this year on this equipment asset was. Bonus depreciation taken in the prior year was 3,478, okay? So right away, we know that this asset's 6,955. We know that bonus depreciation, look at that. Why is it 3,478? What percentage is that? It's half, right? 
It's 50%. Just like I told you things bonus depreciation was back in the day. Why it wasn't section 179, the whole thing? Why wasn't it just section 179 here? I bet they're running a loss, right? So all they could take was bonus here. And then the current depreciation is this. So when we look at accumulated depreciation, is accumulated depreciation supposed to be just this times 11 years or something like that? No. This accumulated depreciation number is adding together what they've taken for bonus and what they've taken for their current year depreciation over several years since 2014. Does that make sense? Let me say that again. This accumulated depreciation, the only way we know that is because if this was a real accumulated depreciation and then bonus depreciation on top of it, we've exceeded the basis, right? 5869 plus 3000, that would be something like nine grand, nine grand and change. And we know the cost was only this. So what's happened here is they've, they've included in accumulated depreciation, the bonus depreciation. This is important because when you're entering information into Halon, Halon wants section 179 and the bonus here, right? So it's going to ask you, what was the bonus? And you're going to put in the 3478. And then it's going to ask you, or up here, and then it's going to ask you, what was section 179? And you're going to leave it blank. And then it knows what the depreciation is supposed to be from there. And if you add up what this is calculating here for these years, it adds up to what accumulated depreciation shows minus the bonus depreciation. Does that make sense? Same thing is happening here on fitness is their bonus depreciation is here. We enter that here in Halon. This is zero again, because there's nothing here. And then Halon calculates out what the prior depreciation was and it matches what is on here. Now inside the Halon tax software, because this, this is a calculator, Halon tax software looks very similar, but it has a way to override it. Let's say the prior tax accountant actually did the depreciation wrong. Let's say that. Well, we need to show Halon what was actually depreciated versus what was supposed to be depreciated. And so you'd do the math on this. You'd say, okay, 1,080 minus 691, the accumulated depreciation is something like 500 or 490 or whatever that is. And you'd plug that into Halon. In this case, it's calculating correctly. And for the most part, if, you, if, you're, if they're using tax software, most of the time it calculates correctly. But if you ever got one by hand, God forbid, but if you ever got one of those, um, you, might have to, you might have to take a look at that. If you suspect uh, depreciations done incorrectly, that's when you need to pick up the phone and call the CPA tax team and have us research it. We will help you with all of this stuff. If you get a statement that's not like Drake and is super confusing, and I'm going to say that again towards the end, but if you get something like that, just call us and we'll take a look at it with you and help you book that depreciation. Um, different software does it different ways. But essentially, we're looking for the same parts. And those are the same items that you're going to put into Halon uh, for each and every client. It's bonus depreciation, section 179, and then making sure you understand you know, accumulated depreciation. Really, we only need section 179 and bonus, but putting in the accumulated depreciation is helpful just to, as a check to make sure that the prior tax return was doing it right. Um, keep in mind, again, it's really just about how to read these things, and you only have to do this once. So for each client, you only have to do it once because we're going to assume you're going to keep using Halon over and over again. As long as you, you, know, you enter that, Halon's going to do the rest. And you know, if you come across some weird situation, uh, like I said, we're, we're here to help you. But that's how it works. And uh, once you're able to do that, and once you're able to read a statement uh, like this and put it in here, you're good to go. Now, let's say you got a tax return from prior year from the client and it doesn't have this schedule. Well, that's a problem, right? We need to ask for it. Ask for it, ask for it. And then if at the end of the day, you still can't get it, put in what you know um, and what you think might be accurate for uh, and, and you move on. You know, you, if you can't, if the other accountant's not going to give it to you, if you can't kind of figure it out from looking at the balance sheet or something on the tax return, maybe it's a small entity and there is no balance sheet required, then you're going to you're gonna take your best guess. And Halon's going to calculate what it thinks the depreciation should have been way back then and then um, 
try and do depreciation correctly going forward. But most of the time, this statement is behind the tax return. So it's in the attachments to the tax return and you can find it. It's sometimes called a federal depreciation schedule. Sometimes it's called a depreciation detail. All the tax softwares, you know, come up with these things. Make sense? Okay. Let's talk about a little bit of real estate. So as I said earlier, I don't want to get too much into real estate depreciation, but I'm going to touch on it a bit. There are two kinds of real estate that really matter when we're talking about depreciation. Commercial and then rental residential real estate. Okay, Commercial means that you're using it to run a business. It's a commercial building. It's like a mall or an office building or something like that. Meaning it is not zoned for residential use. Whereas residential you know, real estate is, is like a rental home, right? It, it is zoned for, for residential use. It has bedrooms and bathrooms and, you know, all of that kind of, not that commercial property doesn't have bathrooms, but you get, it's got living rooms and kitchens and all that kind of stuff. So what it is zoned as and what kind of property is matters because the useful life of commercial real estate is 39 years and the life of rental residential real estate is 27.5 years. So think of it as, you know, the total purchase price to, to come up with depreciation. The total purchase price divided by 39 or by 27.5. Now, what we remember from makers is you can't really do the math like that, right? You can't just divide something and say, there's the depreciation. It's not that intuitive. But uh, re real estate special because it is ac you actually can do it that way. It uses something called straight line depreciation and you can really just divide it by whatever its useful life is and you'll get what the depreciation is well except for the first and last years okay the first year is going to be less than what you would have calculated by dividing it out because it uses a convention that limits the first 15 days of ownership so um it's it it's weird like that right it it's the 15 days you don't get based on the month you place it into service. So let's say that you place a piece of property into service in January and you might say, okay, well then I get the full, I'll just take, if it's commercial property, I'll take the purchase price divided by 39 years and I get the full year, right? Because I pr placed it into service January 1. Not really. It actually, the way that the tables work, you get you get to benefit of it from January 15th on. So you, you miss out on 15 days. And then you end up getting whatever it is back on the, on the last year, um, uh, kind of the 40th year. So it's a little tricky like that. If, if you do have real estate you know, owned by a company, just like with automobiles, uh, make sure it's really in the company name. And on the slide here, I've shown a couple of examples. Our calculator will still do it. So you can, you can pick commercial real estate, you can pick residential real estate, put in what the cost is, and, and it will calculate everything for you. Notice here, let me grab my highlighter here real quick. See here, these were all entered in January of 2018. But look at the 2018 depreciation versus the 2019. See, that's the difference between the 15 days. See that? That's them. That's that's this year losing the 15 days, and then it's the same every single year. And then if I if I were to hit this out all the way out to 27 or or 40 years or whatever, you'd see the little bit of whatever you missed here. You get it in the last year. Okay. So if you do have clients like this, um, make sure that it is actually owned by the business. All the time, I see people say, "Oh yeah, that's I bought the I bought the office. I bought the office," and we automatically assume, "Oh, that must be in the business name." And it turns out it's not. It's in their name. If it is not owned by the business, okay. If it's not owned by the business, you do not capitalize it then in the business. Rather, the business pays rent to the individual or whatever entity they own it through, and report and and they report the income that you're paying them and the depreciation, all of that on their personal return or whatever return that, that uh, for the business that actually owns the real estate. And all you're doing is paying out rent expense. Does that make sense? So just make sure it's in the business name if you really are capitalizing, capitalizing things in there. And we've got auto depreciation, right? We already know a lot about auto expenses. We, we did that whole module, but we need to dive into the details of 
uh, auto depreciation. Uh, with the new 2018 tax law, some some things did change here. And first, let's kind of talk about luxury auto depreciation limits. For the last, I don't know, 35 years, there have been limits on what you can deduct for cars. It was it was not allowed to be treated like normal assets where you just followed the tables and and multiplied the percentage by the cost. Instead, the IRS and Congress capped what was the max allowable each year. So there was a, a maximum amount of depreciation you could take. For 2018 and beyond, that's what I'm showing here in this first on the screen uh, using our calculator, that first asset, the car. I'm showing what the uh, new luxury auto limits are. So for 2018, it's 10,000. Then 2019, it's 16. 2020, it goes to 96. And then for every year after, it's 5760 until you use up all the basis in the car. Okay? So that's, you basically have to memorize the first four numbers. And then after that, it's always the same number in the fifth year and everything else. There is a note, as you can see, there's a note that is, there is bonus depreciation allowed uh, for 2018 and future years until 2023 that, uh, allows you to add 8,000 to the 10,000. So really the first year depreciation, if you included bonus depreciation, you could actually take eight up to 18,000 in the first year, okay? If the car was purchased before fourth quarter of 2017, then it follows the old table. See, technically, technically this new law, this new depreciation, the 2018 tax law started, I wanna say it's, it's in fourth quarter of 2017. So that's why I say if something was purchased before fourth quarter of 2017, then it follows the old tables that are that were like 3,000 and 5,000 a year. So so this new table for 2018 is a huge improvement. It's like it almost doubled. Halon will do all of this for you. All you have to do is just make sure that whenever you know Halon pulls the car uh, asset from your QBO, you say, "Hey, that's a car." You know. And again, the only time a car would be on your balance sheet is if it is owned by the business, right? And as we talked about before, cars are going to be depreciated and expensed through the business 100%. And then the personal, the personal use is going to be grossed up on their W-2, right? So Halon does all this for you. Now, take a look at the other two vehicles. I got big truck and then really big truck. <laughs> Great names, right? So... For the truck that weighs 6,000 to 14,000 pounds, that's big truck. And then really big truck is it, it weighs more than 14,000 pounds. You get to just flat out expense all of those. Okay, 100% bonus depreciation means they'll be written off this year and for the next four years. Same with trucks over 14,000 pounds. So the hardest depreciation is really on the least expensive and least weighing cars, right? It's it's on the passenger vehicles versus the the big SUVs and then big work trucks. If you're not sure what a truck weighs or what a car weighs, you can go to the manufacturer website and look up what's called the specifications. The weight's always there. If it's over 6,000 pounds, you can expense it through the bonus depreciation. So even if a car weighed that much. It's not just trucks. If a car weighed over 6,000 pounds, then it counts and you can depreciate it that way. These these laws are based on weight. So um, if it, usually big SUVs and then big work trucks get over 6,000 pounds, you know, as kind of a general rule. Passenger automobiles, not that I know, unless maybe a Rolls Royce or something that was really heavy, but um, other than that, most of, most everything else is going to be based on the on the luxury auto limit tables. So that is depreciation. And use this, you're going to use this on your accountable plan documents, right? This is the depreciation you'd be plugging into your accountable plans. So that's why it's, it's super important to know. All right, let's uh, keep going. We've just got a few more slides, so bear with me here. I wanted to touch on amortization. Amortization is similar to depreciation. It's, however, it's for intangible assets. And those intangible assets have to have a definite life. So you've heard of something called goodwill that is, you know, kind of the value of a customer list beyond what it's, it's or the value of a business even when you buy it, that's beyond the value of the assets kind of thing. That does not have a definite life. So you can't, you can't amortize a goodwill like that. But 
uh, things that really do expire, like patents or trademarks or licenses, I, I've got on their broadcast rights, that kind of thing. Usually the amortization life is 15 years and the amortization is straight line. So you just take whatever the value of the intangible asset is, divide by 15 and you're good. If you have an intangible asset that you have to amortize like this, be aware, and you probably already know this, you will be upgraded to Halon Assisted. Okay, and the more expensive tax return. Uh, amortization is not inside the the regular Halon system. So you'll have to be upgraded if you have any kind of amortization or intangibles on there. But And, and we'll calculate everything. We will make sure that the right forms are on there. Everything will be super smooth and super good. So let's ask ourselves... So we know that we have to capitalize assets, right? But what assets do we need to capitalize and what can we, you know, forego? Because in the in the absence of kind of a policy about what assets need to be capitalized and then bonus appreciated, everything would need to be, right? And there is something called the asset de minimis safe harbor that the IRS has given us uh, guidance on. And it, it says this, if your client puts a written procedure together that says they will expense anything under $2,500 rather than capitalize it, and you don't expense anything more than $2,500 in that way, then you can expense anything under $2,500 and call it small assets, an expense called small assets. So all of your clients need that policy, right? So that anything under $2,500, you're not capitalizing. You are hitting that expense account, small assets and it's gone, you're right, it's expensed. And the policy is the only issue. You've just gotta have your client sign it and they've gotta keep it in their file. They don't have to send it to the IRS or anything like that. And just as it happens, I have an example policy in the downloads, right? I mean, you don't have to go hunt this stuff up, I've got it for you. It is straight from the AICPA. It is the one that they issue. So you know it's good, right? If you fill it out the way that they want you to, hard to fight that. So just make that maybe part of your onboarding that uh, these should be completed and done for your clients. I'll tell you what, you'll definitely think about it when you start getting $2,500 assets that you've got to capitalize. And you go, wait a second, why am I doing this? I'm going to have them fill out this... this uh, this policy and and be over it. So that should give you an idea of what assets need capitalizing. Anything over 2500. Anything over 2500 you need to capitalize and bonus depreciate away. Okay? And in the same vein, we need to think about, you know, how should you book depreciation throughout the year? You know, should you do it each month? Should it be quarterly? Should it be at year end? Maybe you don't want to do it at all. Maybe you don't want to book depreciation at all. It's too much headache. Here's my advice. Do, do what you think is best. Okay? Do what you think is best. In my shop, we book it. We put it in. We set up a journal entry and we do it every single month. The reason we do that is because our tax projections, when we run our tax projections through Tax Planner Pro, Tax Planner Pro doesn't do depreciation. So having that depreciation in our financials is very helpful because it, it's one less thing we have to try and override or create some weird adjustment for. So we book depreciation every, every single month. And we do that based on that calculator I just showed you with Halon. So um, Halon will issue you what the depreciation is probably going to be next year, at least for the assets that it knows it has. And then if you have new assets, you run that calculator and you create a journal entry. Here's, here's the thing. Only about 30% of my clients have it, right? The, the other 70% don't have any assets that I'm depreciating like this. Certainly not multi-year depreciating. Most of them, if they do have assets, they're getting, you know, bonus or 179 out to where I don't have to worry about booking things the next year, right? So, don't worry about this too much. And here's how Halon treats it. Halon actually ignores it. If you can, if you can, if that makes any, any sense. Halon says, you know what? We're going to look for the account you call depreciation expense and we're going to ignore it because Halon calculates its own depreciation, right? And it's going to use, 
its depreciation number. So if your depreciation number is not perfect or weird or you forgot to do it for a quarter, anything, you're not going to throw Halon off because Halon doesn't use it. Halon creates its own depreciation and plugs that in to the financials. So do it how you want. Don't fret over it. Uh, and like I said, in my shop, uh, we do it. We do it by month. And, um, you know, we do it because we the tax planning is easier. So that that's depreciation, right? I mean, we're, we're just at about an hour right now. I'm almost done. Kind of a marathon. Rewatch this. You know, if I can give you some advice, rewatch this before tax season starts. You know, trust me. You'll be glad you did. Just a kind of a refresher course on, on depreciation. Let me say one last thing before we get into the action plan. And I've mentioned this before. This depreciation stuff can be really confusing. And we have trained our customer support reps at Halon and, of course, the CPA tax team in all things depreciation. So use us. We're here to help you. And we want this done right, too. Believe me, right? You want it done right, so do we. Because if there's a problem here, we've got just as much of a problem as you do. So, you know, as I, as I tell my, my staff, don't try and be a hero. If you, if you get confused on something, ask. We're, we're definitely here to help. Uh, Halon will pull in the dates, the amounts, the names of these assets. All you have to do is tell us what it was, a desk or a car or a, a office equipment or a building or whatever it is. And then you have to enter in the first year, if it's a prior year asset, you have to enter what the seven, 179, the bonus depreciation and the accumulated depreciation is. And that's it. That's, that's going to be your life of depreciation as it relates to Halon and doing the tax returns of your clients. It's, e it's easy once you get the hang of it. Okay. So here's the action plan, you know, use depreciation.halontax.com. That's that calculator I was using to calculate all of your depreciation. Don't try and be intuitive or try and guess too much at depreciation. Use the tables or use the, the software to, to calculate it. If 40% of your assets or client's assets are placed into service after October 1st, that year is going to use mid-quarter convention. And make sure to sync your clients to Halon as soon as possible so you can start depreciating or, you know, managing their depreciation there. And that's, that's a theme you've heard me say. As soon as you get new clients or as soon as you are ready to put a client on Halon, do it soon. Because Halon will then run some calculations for you and show you depreciation. You're going to see it. You can actually code everything and get everything in there. And then go back and say, okay, what's depreciation going to be for this year? And we're already running a report before you've even paid for the software or paid to do the tax return. We've got a report we show you where you can see what the depreciation is going to be. Any asset under 2500 doesn't need to be capitalized if they have a capitalization policy, right? Book depreciation on any schedule you like, monthly, quarterly. Halon can handle any of it because it ignores it, right? And when confused, call us. We're here to help. So that is depreciation, long one. And that also ends our module accounting one. There's only one module left, accounting two. And I can tell you, if you made it through this one, the next one isn't quite as difficult. I, th I think that accounting one is more difficult than accounting two. So if you made it this far, you've probably made it uh, the whole way. You just got to go through accounting two and learn what it's, what it's teaching you. So you're almost there. Thank you for watching. From all of us at Halon, we appreciate you, and I will see you over in Accounting 2.